the thing that I find, and I guess this seems obvious to say, but I didn't really, it didn't clock with me for a long time, is that what is good for one person is not good for another person in terms of like food advice. And I found that really like annoying because I was just sort of hoping that I was like, oh, I just want to read a book and I want, I want the answers. But of course, like that what works for me does not work for someone else. How do we know what is right for our body? And also you could make a change that makes you feel good for a week that mm. is not going to, you're not going to feel great in six months or is going to increase your risk of disease in the long term. Gotcha. Like for example, Monash Uni have a low FODMAP diet which is for people who have certain types of gut intolerances. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure yeah. if anyone on the yes. show has spoken about this. Uh, no, but I'm, I'm, some people in my life uh, are FODMAP uh, right. people. And that diet has FODMAP people. Yeah. And that, that diet has been designed as like a short-term elimination diet. Mm -hmm. And so we, we, the research is quite clear that for certain people, you can adopt that type of that diet and you'll get symptom relief. But it's also well established that you don't want to adopt that way of eating long term because you'll starve the microbiome and end up with further problems later on. Gotcha. Mm, yeah. Right. Um, so I think we have to just be careful to assume that if we adopt, if we change our diet and it makes us feel better tomorrow, that that's necessarily the best diet long term. Interesting. That's mm. so good to know. Yeah. And I would say the other thing I think we need to clarify here is because I agree there is some bio individuality. We all have different genetics, um, slightly different gene. We that will affect what is the sort of quote unquote best diet for us. But I don't think it's as extreme as saying for <laughs> for one person it's all meat and the other person it's all plants. Mm -hmm. I think that there is an established theme. So that theme of eating is a diet that is low in saturated fat, has a good amount of unsaturated fats. I'll bring this back to food in a moment. It's rich in fiber can contain animal and plant protein, but has more plant protein than current average diets and is low in ultra processed foods, mm. right? And that's that theme I was mentioning before. Mm. You mm. can cut that a number of ways. It could be low carb, could be high carb, could be Mediterranean, it could be pescatarian. Mm. Mm -hmm. People don't like that answer because it's not absolute. Yeah, mm. yeah. We, we all want like the definitive absolute answer. And this is one of the reasons why Unfortunately, on social media, a lot of the information that gets a lot of traction is not representative of the science because it's it's the absolute kind of deep conviction style messaging that works best. Yeah. When you put that nuance in and give give like a little bit more context, it's not as sexy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. There's a little more uncertainty. Yeah. And to the layperson who might might hear me say that and think sounds a little wishy-washy, doesn't sound, doesn't sound that confident mm. as opposed to someone saying, I've got, you know, yeah. this is the yeah. single best way. Yeah. But really, like, good science communication is about establishing the uncertainty and, and speaking with some, some nuance. And I think that's a good kind of green flag for people to be aware of on social media. Don't, don't conflate someone saying, at it, who, who's speaking with nuance as not having confidence. Mm. Mm. They're speaking responsibly. They're really. speaking yeah. more responsibly and they're actually, uh, you know, more accurately relaying what's in, what we're seeing within the research. And what I love about that theme is that it's not one way, it gives people option. Mm -hmm. right? So my answer to your question would be, okay, what I've just described there as that diet that's low saturated fat, rich in unsaturated fats, it's high in fiber, has more plant protein than the average diet and it's low in ultra processed foods. There's a number of different ways of cutting cutting mm. that. Mm. Find a way within that theme that leaves you feeling good now, but then also go and do blood work and look at established blood biomarkers that we know determine risk of disease. How do you do that? <laughs> All right, so you can go and look at your basic cardiometabolic biomarkers, like your cholesterol levels, we can dig into that if you want. You can look at your fasting blood glucose, HbA1c, which look at your body's ability to utilize and regulate glucose. So maintain glucose homeostasis, which is affects your risk of developing diabetes. Uh, all, all this information is coming from a simple blood test? Yeah. Right. Yeah. So what, I guess in, if I was just to 
to kind of wrap that up, it's okay, there's a theme that we know is associated with lower risk of disease. Find the, the way within that that feels best for you. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a low carb Mediterranean diet. Mm-hmm. Maybe it's a, a high carb plant based pescatarian diet. Mm. And you, and you know what's right for you from the trial and error. From yes. Doing so you're going to feel right, but then you're also going to go and get some objective markers. Gotcha. So yeah. you go and do your blood work, mm-hmm. and are things coming back, and they're all over the place. Well, if they are, then you you might want to change various things in your diet. It might be that your you you get your test back and ApoB or LDL cholesterol is sky high, mm. and then you may want to reduce the set. Look at the foods in your diet that have a lot of saturated fat and make some swaps. Mm-hmm. Is it? Gotcha. Is it? Because uh, I hear this and think, yes, that's and I'd love to do, but I, I feel like I would get lost in all the the terms and and the phrases. And is, is something you can do with a nutritionist? Like, can you can you have have their guidance to to look at the bloods and have them help you with that? Yeah, you can. You can if you go back if you go and get a blood test done, and things are out then certainly sit, you can sit down with a, a good nutritionist who will know, understand like to be able to firstly look at, okay, what are you eating now? And then be able to make some recommendations as to good swaps that should shift some of those biomarkers in a favorable direction. Mm. Like a simple one is if you you get ApoB tested or LDL cholesterol, which are essentially the same thing, uh, and it was high, this is a really good predictor of your risk of developing ath- atherosclerosis, which is like plaque laying down in the artery. I, to, just to give, and rather than saying if, that's me. Okay. I have high markers in that. Yeah, so we understand that the biggest, the biggest dietary lever that you can change is the type of fat you're consuming. Right. So saturated fats, they, they down-regulate the liver's ability to clear LDL cholesterol. Yeah. Right? So they, they affect a receptor which stops the liver from being able to pull LDL cholesterol back into the liver out of circulation. So LDL cholesterol goes up. Unsaturated fats, particularly polyunsaturated fats, which are found in fatty fish or nuts and seeds, they do the opposite. They upregulate that receptor and help pull LDL cholesterol back into the, to the liver, which mm. drives LDL cholesterol down in circulation. And when you have less of... LDL, less LDL cholesterol circulating, there's less chance of these lipoproteins entering the artery wall and getting stuck. Okay. That's that's the mechanism. Mm. So from a food perspective though, because that can sound like a lot of mumbo jumbo, yeah. for you, like for, 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 for the average person in Australia, that would look like eating less fatty cuts of red meat and instead having fatty fish like salmon or mackerel or anchovies. Yeah. And in doing that, you're going to, you're going to change the, the type of fat that you're consuming in that meal. It would look like having less butter and more olive oil. Okay. Swaps like that. Oil. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, swaps yeah. like that. It would look like having nuts and seeds as a snack, yeah. which have a lot of good unsaturated fats in them. Where do pastry could sit on there? <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like my diet is no good for my... APOB <laughs> a- oh. is, it's like, I guess, like, like cholesterol? Is that what we're... Oh, we're opening a can of worms here. Boys. <laughs> this is good. Okay. Well, uh, I love this go stuff. There. I love this stuff. <laughs> I love this stuff. Okay. So glucose can travel through our blood, can just freely dissolve into blood. It's water soluble. Mm-hmm. Right? We don't glucose have, is like glu- an energy. Glucose. Like, so like if we eat carbohydrates, it gets broken down in, in our intestine, gets absorbed in as a glucose yep. molecule. Mm-hmm. That can just freely float around circulation. It can dissolve into water because mm-hmm. our... Um, blood is essentially an aqueous water solution and can be taken to tissues and used to produce ATP to produce energy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But fat, we can't do that. It's not water soluble. So fat, which is like the fats that we eat or cholesterol, these are both lipid substances. This is like fats as in saturated or unsaturated? Yeah, it doesn't matter, yep. whatever it is. Uh, it, it cannot dissolve into blood, into circulation. So the body through evolution had to come up with a lipid transport system. And what it came up with was we can attach those lipids to a protein. Uh, you may, may have heard of a lipoprotein before. Yes, heard right? that So a, a lipoprotein, lipo is lipid and protein together, we could get a lipoprotein. Uh, the protein is like chaperoning the fat, the fats through, through circulation. It allows the fats to kind of dissolve in. Imagine like a beach ball 
is the protein and you yeah. just shove the fats in the middle right. and then push it into circulation. Right. Sometimes I was picturing a horse with carrying something on its back, but that's probably better. Um, and, 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 <laughs> <laughs> Call me a fatty. You're <laughs> 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 desperate for an analogy. <laughs> A uh, horse with a, no, don't, don't <laughs> worry about it. Okay, there is an, a, a different analogy that sometimes I use, and that's like a a cargo ship. So yeah. you know, we we send things around the world on cargo ships, and this is working. This is better right. than a horse. <laughs> yeah, all the horses like traveling past each other, going, "Hey, <laughs> I've got a look." Let's they, go back to Simon. There could, be, <laughs> there, could, there could be horses on the cargo ship. <laughs> That's confusing now. If that makes you feel better, uh, no, just Simon talk. Okay, so the the cargo ship. Yeah. We, we can't just push the containers into the ocean and expect the mm. current to take them from Australia gotcha. to America. Yeah. Yeah. The cargo ship has to carry them. So the cargo mm-hmm. ship is the protein. Yeah. And on top, those containers are cholesterol and fats. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay? So in our circulation, we have all of these lipoproteins that are essentially carrying fats to tissues that c- can use them as, as an energy source, just like glucose. Some of these uh, lipoproteins contain what's called uh, apolipoprotein B. In short, it's ApoB. And there's one of those proteins per cargo ship. Right? Mm-hmm. LDL, so we mentioned before low density lipoproteins or LDL cholesterol. Yep. When you measure LDL cholesterol, what you're doing is you're looking at the amount of cholesterol within all of the low density lipoproteins. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And just to clarify, when you say LDL cholesterol, is that what when people say I've got high cholesterol, low cholesterol? Is that what you're Usually referring they're referring to LDL cholesterol, which mm-hmm. is measuring the cholesterol content of low density lipoproteins. Gotcha. So it's measuring like the the amount of those cholesterol containers on top of the lipoproteins. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Over time, what we've what we've been able to elucidate in the research is that it's actually not the cholesterol content which dictates risk. It's the number of these cargo ships that have an ApoB protein on them. And okay. each each cargo ship has one ApoB. So now you can order a test that just looks just tells you the ApoB concentration in your circulation. I and, think I'm about to do this. And what that's doing is it's giving you the total sum, so low density lipoproteins, intermediate density lipoproteins, very low density lipoproteins, all of them contain ApoB, and each one of them contains one ApoB. So when you order that, you get the total summation of all atherogenic lipoproteins, which means any lipoprotein that has the potential to enter the enter the artery wall and get stuck. And we know there are cutoff points. So we know that like the average person's ApoB in this country, probably around 110 milligrams per deciliter, should be giving this in Australian units. Perhaps we can do it in the show notes. Mm-hmm. Um, and at that level- I'll you, take care of that. Yeah. <laughs> you do the conversions? Yeah, but, <laughs> yeah, thanks. You. I'll send you guys a conversion. I, I know, think that's I, better. <laughs> I know my, my Australian listeners hate it when I use American units, but in the literature, it's American yeah. units. So, yep. um, is there, The average Australian is probably around 110 milligrams per deciliter. And at that level, we know that you are laying down plaque. Okay. okay. Like atherosclerosis and cardiovascular disease, everyone is being affected by this. Some people will die of it. Some people will die with it. They'll die of something else, but everyone yeah. has it pretty much because of the way mm. we're living. Mm. If you can get that down south of about 80 milligrams per deciliter, now you're getting into a territory where you're either laying down very little plaque or no plaque at all. Mm. And so this is out of all of the chronic diseases, the disease that we know the most about that really people should not be suffering from is atherosclerosis. If you get that ApoB down to an optimal level, you can stop your you can stop it in its tracks and not have a heart attack or stroke. Mm. Right? And and so there are the dietary levers like we just discussed. And for some people, that's enough. They'll be able to get their APB down. But for some people, based on their genetic makeup, they might may, may need medication as well. Yeah. Right. So it's not a one size fits all as yeah. to what works. Okay. Yeah, right. That's a path I'm looking down at the moment. Mm. I've done the test for that the second one. Yeah. Uh, that I've got to do, and the doctor is like, if this test comes back, we need to discuss medication, yeah. but I don't think I'm thinking about diet enough. Let me just add one one mm. more thing. It, this is science over the last 10 years that's become clear, but it takes time 
for kind of laboratory update and insurance update. Mm. So sometimes it can be a little bit expensive. Mm. There's a test that is on a standard blood panel. So usually covered by insurance, you don't have to pay extra called non-HDL. Okay. And that is almost as good as APOB. So if you go in and APOB and they want to charge you a lot of money, just just get non-HDL. Uh, right. for, the yeah. pur- for the purposes of understanding your risk, that's going to be good enough. And what does HDL stand for? Non- Non-HDL non cholesterol is essentially, just before I, I mentioned that you have low-density lipoproteins, intermediate-density lipoproteins, and very low-density lipoproteins. And then you have another class of uh, lipoproteins called high-density lipoproteins. These do not have an ApoB protein on them. They're not atherogenic. So when you measure non-HDL, so non-HDL cholesterol, you measure all the cholesterol in those atherogenic lipoproteins, not the ones that, mm. that are not atherogenic. Okay. So it's a very good proxy for ApoB while not being exactly the same. I'm just mentioning it in case someone goes and finds out ordering ApoB is inaccessible or mm-hmm. it's super expensive. Yeah, okay.